Great. Hello, everybody. My name is Anna Anario, and I run marketing here for Park. We are very pleased to have Alec, Alec Proudfoot, um, and he is of Proudfoot Design, and he's currently the chief designer of Dash Human Powered Airplane Project. He was an en engineer at Google, and he started Recharge IT Plug-in Vehicle Project. He's also um, an avid engineer, consumer and journalist of the fuel vehicle scene, and then he also has had different works so spanning fields from aviation, medical devices, and telecommunications as well. Um, as for hobbies, he likes to play guitar, and then also, besides alternative fuel, fuel vehicles, he's an avid cyclist. In fact, I found out earlier, he is riding across America, which is something, um, something to be commended for. So on that note, please help me welcome Alec Proudfoot. Thank you. Hello. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. <coughs> One second. Uh, so like she said, I'm Alec Proudfoot, uh, chief designer of the Dash Human Powered Airplane Project, among other things. Uh, we had our first flight uh, the end of uh, 2015 at Half Moon Bay. So here's a couple of pictures of that flight. I was the pilot. And I'm going to show a little video. You've seen lots of video as you walked in, but, um, oops, that's the wrong video. And that's supposed to have this queued up. Let's hope that, hope that it works. <clears throat> so I thought this first flight was going to be maybe a little 20 meter hop. I was going to be happy with that. Um, and when I actually took off, I found that it flew really easily. So I felt like I could go the, the rest of the length of the runway. We're about a third of the way down the Half Moon Bay runway. But uh, you'll see I wasn't able to do that. Um, you notice that I start to kind of porpoise here a little bit. And I realize uh, that that was pilot-induced oscillation, and I actually pulled myself out as I was flying it. I let off on the stick, and you'll see that the plane actually trims out really nicely. <clears throat> the reason for that is because we had slowed the servos down to only about 5% of the speed because they were so strong we were worried they were going to break our control surfaces. Help, help, help. That break did not happen because of the servo, but because of a problem with the mount, and I'll talk about that later. We eventually fixed it for all the rest of our flights. There's so much lateral stability in the, in the airplane, I didn't even notice that it had happened and everybody's yelling at me to stop, so I just stopped pedaling and landed. But it, that ended up being about a 230 meter flight, um, which was, it, is a fantastic first flight for a human-powered airplane. Okay, now we'll get into the back to present. <clears throat> so the motivation for the project, I'll go for the motivation for the project, a very brief history of human-powered airplanes. I tend to spend too much time on that, so I'll try to go quickly. Uh, we'll, then we'll talk about the design considerations, the materials, the specifications, you know, why we came up with the airplane that we came up with. We'll go over construction. I'm probably going to have to go through that pretty quickly because we have a limited amount of time. But I've got lots of things to show people here, and we'll have a Q&A afterwards, and everybody can ask me about it. And I've got like 300 more slides I can pick from if there's some, something I need to show people. Uh, and then we'll do some, some more flight highlights and videos and, and talk about the testing that we've done so far, and then Q&A. So why did I, I do this? It was basically just for fun. Um, I had started something called the Google Workshops that were for Google employees to do their own projects at Google, and we just moved into a much bigger space, and I thought I should do some cool project for that. In the end, we didn't actually use the Google Workshops at all to build this, but we did use some buildings that uh, Google graciously donated that they just acquired and hadn't kitted out yet. And so we kind of moved from building to building, to, uh, working to build this. I just wanted to have fun designing and building it. And then if it flew, uh, have, have fun flying it. People often ask me, is there any practical purpose to this? I, I think it's a great way to try to you know, do a lot with a little and to learn about um, doing things efficiently. Um, but there isn't any real great practical experience, but it turns out that there's a, a class of airplanes that people are trying to build right now called stratospheric solar airplanes that are very, very similar in terms of the, the structure, size, weight of these airplanes. So maybe we can talk about that in Q&A. So just going back in history a little bit, 
Uh, this is the Gossamer Condor, who uh, the, the plane that first won the Kramer Prize, and I'll talk about what that was, was in a minute. This was happening in the mid-70s when I was interested in human-powered flight. And at that same time, I was in high school, and I found this book. Um, and I was able to oh, there we go. Uh, and look at the um, you know, equations inside. And it's like, hey, this doesn't look like that's t that tough. This is something that I ought to be able to do. So I, I, I was kind of thinking about this for a long time. Then fast forward 10 years or eight years later, I was working um, after college at AeroVironment, which was started by Paul McCready, um, the guy who, who designed the Gossamer Condor and Gossamer Albatross. And we built the Impact EV, which was is sort of the grandfather of all the EVs out there. Tesla, which is just next door to us here. Um, the Nissan Leaf, the GM Volt and Bolt, all, all of those cars sort of owe their heritage to this, this car, sort of the first modern uh, AC induction EV. While we were working on this at AeroVironment in their Simi Valley facility, this airplane was hanging over our head. There was a ceiling maybe twice as high as the ceiling is here. And uh, we were always, we were working like these 16, 18, 20 hour days to get the car done for the LA Auto Show. But we were always saying we had to take that thing down one weekend and fix it up and go out and fly it. So that was kind of in the back of my mind. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to go a little bit over this history of human-powered airplanes very quickly. Uh, people have been thinking about this forever. This is a, a model of one of Leonardo's designs that's in the National Air and Space Museum. The wingspan's about a fifth of what it needs to be, and he's using the wrong muscles, but he was thinking about the right way of doing it. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, in early 1900s, uh, Peugeot sponsored a prize. I think it was like 5,000 francs, which is maybe $50,000 or something in, in today's dollars, real dollars. And it was very simple. They only had to go, you had to fly, quote unquote, for 10 meters. Um, so people built things like this. Uh, a, a bicycle things at, at a zero angle of attack with some spring-loaded button. Guy would ride really, really fast, hit the button, and then pray and hope that he didn't crash when he, after he hopped in the air. It took about 10 years, and somebody did eventually win this. this. I don't think this is necessarily the one that won, but this is an example of the kind of things that people were building. Then in the late 50s, <coughs> Henry Kramer, who was a British industrialist who was interested in physical fitness and um, uh, aviation, decided to put up a prize to try to uh, have real man-powered flight happen. And real man-powered flight for him and for the Royal Aeronautics Society who, who, spot, or who set up the prize was controlled flight. And they proved that it was controlled flight by making you have to do a figure eight around pylons that were separated by half a mile. <clears throat> so in the air, maybe you would be flying 1.2, 1.3 miles. And so immediately in 1960, people started building airplanes. This Sumpak is the first airplane that successfully took off and um, flew under its own. This over here, there's a big bicycle wheel there. For some reason, the, the first five or 10 years when people were building these, mostly in Great Britain, at first the prize was only for people in England. Then it was expanded worldwide. It started out as a 5,000 pound prize, and then they kept raising it, and they opened it up to the whole world. So eventually it was a 50,000 pound prize, which at the time was the biggest prize around. But anyway, the people in England the first few years, they they thought that they needed to have like the acceleration of the bike wheel to be able to take off. They didn't trust that the thrust from the prop was going to be enough to take off. It turns out that was just a big waste of weight and momentum, um, and you don't need that. <clears throat> this is another uh, what was a successful airplane, um, but it's really interesting to note how intricate it is. It's, it's based on sort of wooden sailplane design. It's an all wood design. It's got uh, wood leading edge, uh, the spar is wood, and um, just lots and lots and lots of work went into that. Um, this is a picture of it flying. It was the first human-powered airplane to fly for a kilometer. I'm skipping over some slides, so I'm going to skip over some videos and stuff because we don't have enough time. Meanwhile, and there was lots of other airplanes. There was planes in Japan, lots of planes in England. People got up to the point where a, a, an airplane that looked similar to the, uh, where was it, to this one uh, built in Japan actually flew for over a mile and was able to start doing 90 degree turns. These airplanes had a, a big difficulty in turning because they're very light and the adverse yaw of um, having ailerons 
cause these things to really not turn very well. So Paul McCready was a um, Caltech grad from in Aero Astro who had won the national and international soaring competitions. Um, and then he got involved in the early hang gliding field. And he realized he, he'd heard about this prize. And he was going on a vacation, driving around, thinking about it. And he realized that the power that a hang took uh, was about it. Um, a horsepower, you know, powered by gravity as it was flying along. And if you if you increase the span three times, but kept the weight the same, that would go down to about a third of a horsepower, which is what a, a really fit cyclist put, could put out for five or ten minutes and be able to to fly. So he did something completely different. I mean, you can see how different this airplane looks. There's just a few aluminum ribs, single surface, kind of ratty looking, not even taut. Um, it's a weird design. It's a canard airplane. Uh, the pilot's out in the breeze. They put it together in, a, in like a weekend and then rebuilt it out in the desert a, a week later and it immediately flew and immediately flew for min minutes at a time. Had a lot more wing area than those other airplanes so it flew slower and it's hard to see but there's lots of little wires both on the top and the bottom here. That's why the spar is so minimal because most of the lift load is taken up by the wires. And they were able to get away with that because there's so much more wing area, their cruise speed was slower. Now we're talking about the difference between 10 miles an hour and 20 miles an hour. But that makes a huge difference in the amount of drag, um, which goes with the square speed and the power, which goes with the cube of speed that those, those wires were taking up. So they could get away with this, this kind of design. Eventually, they, they basically flew every day multiple times. Uh, they had over 400 flights McCready thought they could win the prize in a month or six weeks. It, it, it took almost exactly a year, but they, um, they ended up having double surface airfoil. Uh, um, they put a fairing around the pilot. Uh, they, they came close several times, and then eventually they, they won the prize. Um, and I'm not going to show that video either. Uh, and then Kramer said, OK, well, 17 years to win from 60 to 77, so let's make another prize that's way harder that's going to take another 15 years. Let's give a 100,000 pound prize, that's about 500,000 in today's dollars, to um, fly across the English Channel. And um, these guys were really good at building airplanes. Carbon fiber was just coming out, so they switched to carbon fiber for the spar. That let them get rid of about half of the wires. They could fly a little bit faster. They got a more efficient propeller. And within two years, on their first try, um, they flew across the English Channel. It was a, it, there's a lot of, I could spend five minutes on that flight, but uh, I don't have time. This is before landing in France, just a, a minute or so after this picture was taken, when it landed, one of the per people on the other side reached up to hold one of the wires and snapped the wing. And that gives you an idea of how fragile these airplanes have to be or can be in order to be able to fly. Uh, then Kramer had a speed prize, and this is the airplane I talked about earlier. Uh, there was a contest where you could store energy human power uh, with human power for five minutes and then add that to human power while you were flying around a triangular course, I believe. And a team from MIT and, and these guys kept ping-ponging back and forth, setting a new record. And then this guy built an all-human powered airplane that beat both of them, which is pretty amazing. So the guys from MIT decided, let's build the ultimate human powered airplane. And they built their own, own challenge. It wasn't for a contest or a prize. They got sponsors, UTC, Michelob, a bunch of other people. Um, and they wanted to recreate the, the myth of Daedalus and Icarus. So they built three airplanes, one prototype and two you know, competition planes, if you want to call them that. They did a bunch of testing in the desert. This is out in the desert near Edwards. And then they went out and waited for about a month and a half for the right weather. And um, they had five different pilots, and it just happened to be the one Greek pilot it was the one that was there when the weather was, was trained up when the weather got good. And they did it on their first try. But the interesting thing is uh, it was uh, 115 kilometers, so about 72 miles, and just under four hours duration. That's still the record for human-powered flight. Um, they got, it was from Crete to the southern island of Santorini, and there was a lot of wind on that island when they got there. And he was trying to sort of force it onto the, the beach. Uh, and all of a sudden, the tail boom and then the wing cracked and collapsed. And the whole thing fell into the water just a few feet off of the shore. So sort of creating the flight of both Icarus and Daedalus in the same. 
Um, but everybody was, you know, the pilot was fine. Everybody was really happy. And um, like I said, that record still stands. These days, there's this thing called Birdman Rally in Japan. They take off from this 10 meter platform. It's quite dramatic, especially when they have an airplane that doesn't fly very well and it plunges into the ground. Um, and they have contests where they go 500 meter out and back, a speed contest. And then and there was about 10 or 12 airplanes built for that. And there's about 20 airplanes built for the, the distance competition. This lake's maybe two and a half size, uh, times the size of, of Lake Tahoe. And it's in the middle of Honshu, the, the main uh, island of Japan. Um, and the record for this is, uh, over all the years, has been a 38 kilometer long flight. They build airplanes that look just as good as the Daedalus, but I think uh, the year I was there, it was 100% humidity and about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I think that's the reason. I think it's actually not an airplane performance issue. It's a pilot performance issue that they ha you know, nobody in this contest is actually farther. And then the last thing I want to mention about human powered history is there was this thing called the Sikorsky Car Prize uh, for human-powered helicopter. And <clears throat> it's only to hover for one minute, get up to 10 feet, and stay in a 30-foot by 30-foot box. And that sounds like, oh, that must be easy compared to flying for four hours. Um, but helicopter flying in their own wake, um, it's kind of the difference between you know, climbing up or walking up a, a shallow ramp versus going up one ropes in the gym. It's, it's just a lot harder um, problem. And they had to build these things very, very light for them to even take off at all. For many years, this, this contest was in play for like 30 years. People had flown an inch or two off the ground in a, for a few seconds. And then finally, a team from Maryland and this team from Canada um, built these huge quadcopters that started to, to fly you know, many feet in the air and for, for, for many seconds and minutes until they eventually won the prize. I, I recommend looking these up on YouTube later. <laughs> And watching the videos, including the crashes sometimes that it had from height, which were pretty dramatic. OK, so now let's talk about Dash and uh, the design of Dash. Um, I'm going to talk about design considerations. Um, basically, we had to set up some constraints here. Some of them are you know, set by physics, and some of them are just our own constraints. I wanted to have, keep it simple. And Dash actually stands for Dead Simple Human Powered Airplane. It's, it's an acronym. Um, and I wanted to design it so that I could transport it. Like the Gossamer Condor and Gossamer Albatross were built, and then they just stayed in a gigantic hangar. We didn't have a gigantic hangar, so we wanted to have, be able to put it in some sort of trailer and, and take it around and fly it in different places. And I wanted to build it to 2.5 Gs. Daedalus, which broke at the end of the flight, was at 1.75 Gs. So that means that our airplane is going to be heavier than Daedalus, but it is still within the realm of possibility that we didn't have to make it so heavy that it wasn't flyable. Another thing I wanted to mention here, uh, flight time. I wanted a normal person to be able to fly for a couple minutes. I'll show you a graph of human power in a second. An athletic cyclist to fly longer, you know, many minutes or hours like Daedalus was able to do. And then cost the same or less than a moderately expensive luxury car. I ended up starting to call this my Tesla. Um, in the end, it ended up being like my two Teslas. But, <laughs> but actually, I mean, compared to the, the price of some of these other ones, the fact that we had all volunteer labor um, and we used you know, the recommendations of a lot of people that had done this before, we were able to do it for a pretty cheap price. So the Daedalus project was a, a multi-million dollar project uh, in today's dollars. Uh, so I'm not going to read this whole slide. but. Um, Keep it simple. I already talked about that. It was it's relative low speed aerodynamics are pretty basic. It's it's equations. You don't have to use a lot of complicated, um, you know, computer fluid dynamics or anything like that. But the thing I wanted to emphasize is this one right here. Get advice from HPA pioneers. So the Aerovelo guys that did that human powered helicopter and also a human powered ornithopter. Look that up on YouTube. Um, they gave us tons of advice. Uh, I'll show a tool in a minute that we used that was basically their design. There was people in England. We went to go to uh, HPA rallies over there. There was people um, in uh, the, the Japan Birdman rally and people up in, um, in Canada uh, in Montreal who built a human-powered airplane. And all those people were very gracious and you know, told us, you know, I'd say, well, how do you do this or what's the best way to do that? And by doing that, I was able to really make an airplane that worked the first time. <laughs> um, one person here, Rick, in, in the in the audience, he built a downwind 
faster than the wind air, uh, car, and he was able to um, hook us up with the guy who machined our propeller. I'll show, show you that later. So I mean, everybody was, was uh, very generous about helping us, and that I think was a big secret of having something that was a success the first time. And like I said, we didn't do any fancy aerodynamics because you don't, you know, you're not designing an F-16 here. The real, you know, tricks here are doing the structural stuff right. The aerodynamics are not that complicated. Um, I'm going to skip over that. So, what are the challenges with human-powered airplanes? Um, you, a human is a really lousy engine. Um, basically. A really, really fit cyclist is putting out less than a third of the, you know, the hair dryer that you use in the morning, and yet you're trying to, you know, lift a 150, 200 pound person plus the weight of the airplane. So that means, in order to make that work, you have to have light weight. But that's directly contradicting the next thing you need, which is you need very long wings. The re reason you need very long wings is you need to lower what's called the induced drag or the drag created when you have lift. So that's why sailplanes have really long wings, and that's why human-powered airplanes have incredibly long wings. We had a decision to make on Dash. Did we want to build something like the Gossamer Condor, which had really big wing area and was supported by all these wires, or did we want to build something closer to the Daedalus, which has these transportation brakes here and just has one lift wire? Um, we didn't have a, you know, a hangar with 120 feet of space in order to do this. And we really needed to do transport. And I wanted to build something that kind of had decent performance. So slow and draggy, fast or sleek. Remembering that slow and draggy is 10 miles an hour, and fast and sleek is like 15 or 16 miles an hour. Uh, we, we picked something closer to the Daedalus idea. So materials consideration, you have to have a, a bunch of modern materials, carbon fiber, Kevlar, in order to make it light enough, uh, mylar for the covering. But it's also a lot like building a gigantic model airplane. You, you, you know, you're building ribs up, and you're using wood in various places. So a lot of you know, high, high modulus carbon fiber, Kevlar, fiberglass, et cetera, lots of different foams, a little bit of aluminum and titanium and steel wire. But this is probably, I don't know, 1 or 2% of the weight of the airplane is, is metal. And then this is the, the stuff that's a lot like building model airplanes, balsa wood, plywood, spruce and various glues along with mylar. So I started out with a spreadsheet in Google Docs that was about <clears throat> three cells. It was like the three basic aerodynamic um, equations. And then it sort of turned into this massive spreadsheet with an altitude model and a weight estimation model um, based on this paper that the Daedalus guys did um, by Juan Cruz. And then I went through and I just tried out very, you know, I, I made assumptions about what the weight was that I wanted to carry and um, how fast I wanted to fly and things like that. And I tried out different uh, various wing plan forms. Basically, when you're designing this, the wing is the thing, right? You have to have a tail and everything else, but the wing dominates. <clears throat> Later, I was able to come up with a graph showing how I picked what I did just by kind of plugging in numbers and looking at the results. This is a graph showing wingspan in meters. And this is power. This is for the heaviest pilot we designed for 90 kilograms, about a 200-pound pilot, which just happens to be about what I am. Um, and for that pilot, 300 watts is something that a really uh, in-shape pilot can do for a long period of time. <clears throat> You'll notice that it, this is for a lot of different wing areas. We ended up in between 35 and 45, sort of between 35 and 40. So we're sort of the red or kind of orange curve here. But they all kind of converge on the same answer. In order to get below 300 watts, you have to have a wingspan of about 33, 34 meters. That's about 110 feet. It's a huge wingspan. And then you see it continues to get better for a while, and then it starts to go back up. The reason it starts to go back up is because eventually the decrease in power you get by increasing the wingspan is overwhelmed by the increase in spar weight that you have to have by having a longer and longer and longer wing supporting you know, uh, approximately the same weight, so it has a much bigger bending moment. So, the max out here somewhere around 40, 45 meters. This, this is just a visualization of what's happening with induced drag. The drag when you create lift is basically high pressure on the bottom leaking over to the low pressure on the top and creating this big vortex on each wing tip. And that's all wasted energy. The longer and thinner the wing is, the smaller that vortex is. 
So when we first designed this thing, I, I did the spreadsheet. I made a bunch of little hand-based sketches like this. Eventually, we did finite element analysis in SOLIDWORKS, but I didn't want to spend the time to do detailed uh, drawings of the entire thing or, or detailed models of the entire thing that I could pull, pull drawings off because basically we're just building tubes. So from the finite element results, we basically made some templates and then put, you know, we iterated with finite element and came up with the dimensions and everything. Um, and then we just did it by hand um, and sent that to this carbon fiber tube manufacturer in, in New Zealand that built the tubes for us. Eventually I did build a solid model, is what it looks like. And then this gives you a good idea of what the plane itself looks like. So it's a lot like Daedalus. We have a bigger wing area, which makes it slightly lower power, but also fly a little bit slower. It has four transportation brakes, so five, five main wing sections. To try to keep it simple as part of the dash concept, uh, we have constant cord uh, tail sec uh, ribs and constant cord for the middle three sections. So the center and the two middle sections have constant cord. So basically, we could just pop out the same rib over and over again to have a little bit of economy of scale. But then in order to have an efficient airplane, you have to have taper at some point so that you can get close to an elliptical lift distribution. So the, the outer wing panels uh, have taper. So every one of these ribs is unique. And then I heard that 33.3 meters was maybe enough to fly, but I wanted to you know, maybe be able to lower the drag even more. So we made a wingtip extension you could plug on that added another three meters. And then we made a longer outer wing section that was a little bit longer than that, and another wingtip extension on that. So we've, we've basically flown three versions of the airplane, 33.3 .3 meters, about 110 feet, 36.3, about 120, and then 40 meters, of like 130 feet. Um, and each, each time you're dropping about tw 15 or 20 watts of power needed, but you're also making the wing a little bit weaker. Oh, and this lift wire here, one thing to, to mention about this, it adds about eight watts of drag, just from the drag of the wire, but you save about eight kilograms of weight in the middle, and it's about three, three and a half watts per kilogram that it takes to, to fly extra weight. So it, about 30 watts is, is saved by having about eight watts of drag from that lift wire. This gives you an idea of how big the airplane is. Um, this is our shortest wingspan version of Dash, and this is a 737 that you're all probably familiar with. Uh, this weighs about 45 kilograms, or about 100 pounds, and this weighs about 70,000 pounds. Um, this is just a CAD model of the main spar. The, uh, um, later, you can come look at these, and you can see a cross-section of, of one of the spars. Um, there's two torsion layers that are at 68 degree angles. Uh, most optimum would be 45, but this had to do with how the, the spars were built. Um, thin, so this is about 0.4 millimeters thickness. And then there's a bunch of spar caps going longitudinally along the span. That's the nice thing about carbon fiber is, is you can tailor it to be strong in the direction that you want to. So we go from, if we go back to this picture, um, eight layers of spar cap in the middle, and then we just, we taper it by tapering the number of layers. So eight, seven, six, four, two, one, by the time we get out to the tip. And the other thing to notice about this is this shape. This is the shape under 1G of loading. We're, we have a two-axis airplane. It's got a vertical tail and a horizontal tail. We don't have ailerons because ailerons don't work very well in this case anyway, and they add weight and complexity. So um, just like a, a radio control model, if any of you have ever flown one of these, you can fly with just the rudder. The rudder basically kicks the wing over like this, and now this has a higher angle of attack, and this has a lower angle of attack. So it has what's called yaw roll coupling, where it kind of rolls like this. It's very kind of slow, wallowing turn, but it still handles OK. It's kind of an unusual airplane to fly, because this is about five or 10 times slower than the pitch, which is really, really twitchy. And you'll see, I'm going to show you a video of a crash we had that was a result of how twitchy it is in pitch. Um, and this is finite element analysis results. Every notch here is where the spar cap is changing, and then this is where the lift wire is taking up most of the load. This gives you an idea of how light. This is one 6.7 meter wing spar that I'm balancing on one finger. But it's got to be light, right? Because the entire airplane weighs about 100 pounds. 
about half the weight of the pilot. We did find that element on some other parts. This is one of the few aluminum parts. This is the lift wire clamp that the lift wire attaches to. It gets glued in and lashed to the wing. This is that part, partly machined on a four axis mill. And this is kind of a fun video. <laughs> this is our second prototype prop. We built it just as a, as, as a practice thing, but then it looked like it might be a decent prop. But the engineered uh, prop spar that we had that had spar caps in it and was designed to take the load wasn't ready yet, so we used carbon fiber ski poles that were the same size. And this is what happened. You know it can't be good when I say something like that. Um, so, <laughs> go back to percent. So, we did eventually hit the prop spars, and we did. The, you'll see in a, in a minute that we did the same kind of load testing on the main wing spars. So basically, what you do is you take a bunch of bottles with the right amount of water, so that you give that the elliptical loading. In, in on, on a prop, it's more like a triangular loading, um, and prove that it can with, withstand. Um, you know, the biggest load you're going to put on it. And so all the props we've built since then have been just fine. <laughs> uh, so design specs, I've, I've talked about some of these already. We, we were shooting for 80 pound airplane weight, 36.3 kilograms. It came out a little bit heavy for various reasons, but still uh, pretty reasonable at about 45 kilograms. The max payload is 90 kilograms, about 200 pounds. Span is 33.3 up to 40. And to give you an idea, th these are a little bit low because this was for the desired weight, so add about 15 watts in your mind here. But the, the heaviest pilot, it's maybe 315, 320 watts. Um, and a sort of medium weight person is around 250, 260. Uh, I don't know how much that means to, to people. Some of you, I assume, are cyclists. But uh, it's, a, it's a pretty brisk cycling load, but it's doable if you're in good shape. And it's doable for a short period of time, even if you're not a, a a heavy cyclist. And this shows that. This is, uh, this is sort of a semi-log plot. If we did this on a linear plot, it, the, the curves would look almost straight down and then straight across. It, this is it. So we're expanding this part. And <clears throat> this is the anaerobic region where people are basically using up the ATP in their muscles. And this is the aerobic part where basically you can put out the same amount of power for very long periods of time. But you notice, and we tested, this is a graph with, I don't know, six or eight people on it. We tested over 30 people doing uh, time trials, about a 30-minute time trial. And your average Joe, like if you're not cycling much, this is probably how you would do, like these people here. So they could fly the airplane for like 25 seconds or 20 seconds or something like that. I guess it's 15 seconds because this is in minutes. Um, and that's forgetting the fact that you have to actually accelerate the plane to take off to begin with. But then there's other people over here, like these people, that actually can fly for a decent amount of time. I have, this happens to be one of my tests, this dark blue one. And, and back then, I was in better shape and lighter than I am now. And I should have been able to fly the plane for somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Um, the longest flight I've actually done is just under two, two minutes and about 630 meters so far. This is uh, the graph of our best pilot so far, who's always flown our longest flight every time we've gone to fly. And you can see he's going to flatten out asymptote here above four watts per kilogram and our airplane takes depending on which wingtips it has on it 3.3 to 3.5 watts per kilogram so you can see that as long as he's rested and has enough food and water he ought to be able to fly this plane for a long period of time so i'm going to go over the construction details really quickly because i don't want to run too long and then i'm going to show a couple more videos and then we'll open it up to questions and uh, go from there uh, first thing we did was build tables because it's really important to have big tables to build these wings on. And then we built some propeller blades. This was a 10 foot diameter. Then we went up to a uh, 12 foot diameter to get a couple efficiency points better. And we, we hot wire cut these out. This is the same one that you saw breaking, uh, the shaft breaking on earlier. And then we, we realized that these were too heavy because they had a really big cord. So these weighed about 750 grams each. We wanted the whole prop to weigh about one kilogram. So we changed the design rotational speed of the prop and came up with something that's much narrower. This is some graphics and a, a test run on the machining. 
Um, and then this is the actual pieces machine. You see we even went to the level of machining little pockets in the thick part to save a little bit of weight. That saved about 50 grams per blade. <coughs> this is uh, just a few pictures of this in process. You can see the prop spar here. And then when it gets too thin up here, there's just, um, just a, a spar cap by itself on each side. And then this whole thing gets encased in two layers of very lightweight fiberglass, which make it a lot stronger and stiffer. And eventually, uh, learning our lesson um, from that break and also trying to better distribute the stress, we eventually tied in this part of the prop shaft or prop spar with some carbon fiber on the um, on the fiberglass there. But here you can see those uh, the spar caps that are kind of there. You basically, you you machine a groove in the top, or um, and then you lay it in there and then put some spackle and stuff to get it nice and smooth. So this is sort of the three generations of our prop, and this is that one that we've actually used to fly the plane with. This shows how you make the, um, the ribs. You use a computer-controlled hot wire to cut out the shape. This part on the outside is called the shuck. And then you take <clears throat> this very, very lightweight um, three-layer plywood. It's, I think this is 0.4 millimeter as well. Um, it's, it's almost like paper. You can cut it with scissors. And you laminate that onto the top of this rib. And you put the shuck back in. And you put it all in a vacuum bag. And so it holds it on real tight. And you end up with something like this. This is one of the outer ribs. It's much smaller. Then you take that onto a bandsaw, and you cut six millimeter wide ribs from it. And then and it took a little bit of practice to be able to do that consistently, get consistent thickness. And I'm going to skip videos here. Um, and then you laser cut out these doublers. They have little notches, and there's little marks on the rib so that you can line everything up perfectly. You glue those on. And then you use the doublers as the template for cutting out the hole for the, the spar and the rear spar. Um, this is showing building some small, short test samples of the trailing edge. Eventually, these were built in 16-foot lengths. And that's made out of Kevlar with another kind of foam. You'll all get a chance to come up and look at this stuff later, but this is a short piece of um, the trailing, what the trailing edge is like. And that fits in there and gets glued in there. And then there's a, a leading edge that's made out of this Depron foam, which we came up with the process to heat, heat form. Uh, that's so that you get a consistent rib shape in between the ribs. These are laminar flow airfoils, and the shape is very important. This shows uh, bending the seat. We copied a, a recumbent seat one of our sponsors, Lightning, makes. But we use much thinner gauge tubing to save weight. So it's about half the weight of, of um, the seat that we, we basically copied. Um, we don't have, you know, we don't have potholes or going over or anything like a bike, so it doesn't have to be quite as strong. This shows the fuselage frame lashed together. Uh, when you come up, you'll be able to see this, this is an aluminum tube. It was used mostly, except for the seat, which was aluminum, it's used mostly on attaching carbon fiber to carbon fiber. It's a way to build a really strong joint on tubes that are so thin that if you just glue them together, there's no, no area for the glue to hold, so there's no strength. So instead, you just tack glue them together, and then you lash this. It's kind of like um, I'm in the Boy Scouts or something. I was never in the Boy Scouts, but it seems like you know you use stick and twine to lash things together. But you're using this high-tech fiber, and then you infuse it with epoxy. It makes an incredibly strong joint that weighs almost nothing. Um, we had to clean out the inside of the tubes for all the release agent so that we could put these things called biscuits inside. Because these tubes are so thin, even though they're very, very strong in bending, you could get to the point where they would look buckle. So the example I like to use is, is a um, uh, soda can when the top's still on. Even though it's very thin-walled, because of the pressure inside, you can't really crush it very easily. But as soon as you pop that top and drink a little, it's very easy to crush it from the outside. So these things were doing the same, same kind of job. And we practiced doing it in um, a plas clear plastic thing just so we could develop the tools. And you can see that this part ends up being really, really stiff. The place where it's not supported, it's really easy to ovalize. If you come up and squeeze this, don't squeeze too hard, because this is the last sample I have that this part isn't cracked. 
Everybody likes to squeeze them very hard for some reason. So this is showing the biscuits in process. You notice there's a lot of different diameters. So every tube, not just the, the wing spars, but all the tubes and the fuselage and everything got these, um, this treatment. It only added a, a couple kilograms to the airplane, but made it, the tubes you know, potentially much stronger. So this is showing a little bit of the process to put them in there and then actually doing it. How are we doing on time? I better get going. Uh, there's a little bit of metal in the airplane. This is uh, titanium used in the prop spar or prop shaft, excuse me. This is showing me drilling the brackets that hold the wing together. The wing, they actually slide together right here, the two tubes. There's a sleeve in there and slide together and that takes most of the force. But to pre prevent it from torquing, you have to have a bracket back here and back and like this. Um, we, you put this pin in to hold it together. So there's a, one piece going in between two pieces gets pinned together. This, believe it or not, is all that's holding the airplane to the wing. Uh, this aluminum tube and a few wraps of Kevlar, it doesn't look like much, but this is actually a five times safety factor over the 2.5G loading with just that little bit of Kevlar. This shows uh, hooking up the front wing mount and the rear wing mount, getting them all aligned and glued in place so that everything goes together smoothly. And then these, these kids are getting the water bottles ready for that same kind of test for the, the wing. We took them to Hiller Museum and then we made this sort of aluminum pseudo fuselage to use for the test and used a forklift and lifted it up until all the water bottles were off the ground. We used that to dial in the exact link, length of the lift wire to get the right dihedral at 1G and then we tested it at 1.5G to make sure it wouldn't um, have any problems in flight. And it's just another picture of that. We had a problem when we did the larger wing, and it wasn't a problem with the wing. It was a problem with the forklift. The forklift had a hydraulic leak, and this and we forgot to retie a, a safety from here to here on the second day when we were doing testing. And so when it, when it tilted back too far as the forks were going down, eventually it overcame the friction and rotated. And we were really lucky that this stuck on the fork. Otherwise, the whole thing would have completely be pulled apart. This looks really bad, but this is the actual wing that we've been flying. It kind of zippered apart, but it only took a few hundred grams of extra weight with extra doublers and stuff. These, it all kind of went back together like puzzle pieces. I'm going to skip together forward really quickly so we can get a couple more videos in here before questions. This is the heat bath we used to form the leading edge. This is the leading edge of one of the uh, uh, tail surfaces. This is putting a, a adhesive mylar on, on top of the Depron on the leading edge so that it would have a nice smooth surface for the laminar flow. And then this is a series of slides showing us putting the mylar on the rest of the wing. So you tape it on the front. There's a contact cement on each of these thin little wood pieces on the ribs and on the, on the back here. And that's heat activated with an iron. And then you use an iron on all the wrinkles in the middle and it's amazing how smooth it gets. I don't know if this one is really unwrinkly right now or not. It's pretty good. There's a couple wrinkles in here, but it makes a really nice, smooth surface. You can see there's some wrinkles in this bay, but if we just took an iron over that again, it would make it uh, nice and smooth. This gives you an idea of how light this is. When you come and look at this later, please pick it up by here. Don't try to pick it up by this, because if you do, you'll uh, potentially break the trailing edge. <laughs> These things are very uh, somewhat delicate. Also, if you get a look at the prop, the trim is a little bit sharp on the prop, so just be careful. <coughs> we went back to Hiller Museum. Um, they were very gracious to let us do this and did a test assembly when we had most of the parts done. A few things like the fuselage fairing and the, the real wheel bracket weren't done, but most of the plane was done. And just a few more pictures here. I'm going to go real quick. Uh, this is some of the repair. This is building the fuselage fairing. And at the tub at the bottom. We wanted to have a molded nose, but we ran out of time, so our nose is a little bit lumpy, and we're going to fix that at some point, and that'll save us a few watts of drag. That's the, the finished fuselage. We had to build our own trailer to, tra to do this, and then I found out after we spent a bunch of time and money. The project was almost as hard as building the airplane that we could have bought something for cheaper than what we spent to build it. But 
So let's talk about the test flights for a few minutes and then we'll do some Q&A. So our first flight was in December 2015. We've had a total of, since then, 26 flights, eight pilots. We've done about 15 kilometers total distance and 35 minutes duration. Our longest flight is basically the full length of the Moffett runway, uh, the shorter of the two Moffett runways. And um, we're ready to go to the desert and then we had this problem in our last flight in December that we're, um, we, we're fi we fixed the damage from and we're still tweaking the design before we start flying again, hopefully in the next month or two. So um, that's out of place. That's not where it's supposed to be. But anyway, we have a test rig and a flight simulator with accurate dynamics for the airplane, which proved to be really good for um, training the pilots. So this is a picture of our setup for the first flight. And you can see that when you do this, you're in the dark, basically, literally. Uh, you start about 4 in the morning. You fly in the morning because that's when the wind is low. If the wind gets more than about five miles an hour, it's too windy to fly this anymore. And usually the wind is low in the morning. Also, Half Moon Bay only had to run one, one runway, so they um, actually shut the entire airport down for us between 6 and 9 a.m. Um, really pretty skies there. skip showing another video. I had about two hours of sleep the night before, so when I put my helmet back on, I put it on backwards. Um, but I, I was just amazed at how successful the first flight went. We had that problem with the breakage, and it turned out it was because this flange got cut back a millimeter or two too short, and this is the high stress part of the, the piece. You can see how it's separated and delaminated here, and actually if I pulled my finger further over here, it actually delaminated all the way around. So we went ahead, this is the test piece, which it's hard to tell, but there's just a couple more millimeters of material there that we did that car top test, and you may have seen in the video that was playing when you walked in. Um, and that was enough to make the difference. So we went overboard, we got a bunch of carbon fiber, we put a strut in and big flanges, and that's worked just fine ever since. It added a few hundred grams. We were ready to fly the next day, but it was um, raining. so. And then back in February, we had eight flights by six pilots, and we've really had <clears throat> pretty successful flights except for the couple of incidents I'll show you. I'm going to just skip forward. I'm going to go through the pictures really quickly here. On that day, we had our first female pilot fly, this ginger, and I'm just going to show you these pictures in quick succession. <clears throat> Sorry, the voice is getting a little rough here. This is a, uh, the wheel is a, does anybody recognize this wheel? It's a blow molded wheel from one of those automatic uh, trash bin things. Um, it's very light and it works pretty well, but it seems to wear out after a few flights. So we ended up putting another wheel, it'll come up in a few pictures, it's a little bit heavier. But if we go back to doing, you know, actually trying to set any records, we'll switch back to this wheel just to save that little bit of extra weight. We'll skip forward here. So we switched to Moffett in June. There's two runways here. This one's two and a half kilometers and this is 2.25 or something like that. So this is the one that we get to use and they keep the airport open. So we're not limited by time, but practically we are because by 10:30, 11 o'clock, too many thermals and stuff come up and too much wind comes up to be able to safely fly. <clears throat> this is another picture of Moffett. This is setting up Moffett. That's that new wheel that we switched to. And this is the first flight at Moffett. That's me flying again. Um, and then this is Craig. Craig, every so time we fly, sets a, long, a, a longer flight distance. So this is a 1.3 kilometer flight. Then he did a mile long flight. Then he did a 1.9 kilometer, which is our longest so far. Um, and then we had a crash. I'll show you the video of that in a second. Is because we didn't have good stick feel and as I mentioned, we're so twitchy in pitch. So we changed the stick to be more of like an RC stick where there's very obvious detents. And we try to do pitch just with the trim buttons and then try to only do lateral motion. And then we retrained all the pilots uh, on the flight simulator. And that's worked out really well. We also had problems with the plane veering off the runway and hitting tips and stuff. So we also retrained all the people that were doing the wing running. So that's just some of the damage that happened that's all been fixed. We use this as an opportunity to redo the way that we did the front wheel a lot better. And just some power.
curves. This is me. You can see that I'm running out of gas. And then the next, <laughs> that was still a pretty good flight. I think that was my long flight. And then these are two guys who, you can see the extra power it takes to first take off, but then they actually are holding relatively steady power. This one happened later in the day around 10, 30, or 11, and these are, every time he got a big gust, it took more power to kind of get out of it. But the, the, in general, the power is doing pretty good from what we expect. This is the new joystick I mentioned. These are the trim buttons here. Okay, let me switch to some video. <clears throat> and then we'll wrap it up and go for questions. So what do we have here? That's wrong video. Sorry about this, there we go. So this is just, I really like the sky here and this is one of Craig's long flights. I think this is the mile long flight perhaps. <clears throat> just gives you a sense of how it works. So there's two people that run with the wing and as the wing starts to lift up, um, they're holding on to cords. They sort of let those cords slide through their hands and eventually they let go. And then you'll notice that there's people following on bikes. Now this is one of the pe people following on the bikes is actually taking the video and this is the person on the other wing. And they're basically prepared when he gets ready to land, <clears throat> usually he'll tell them and we also have radio communications going. Um, they'll ride up as close as they can, they throw the bike down on the ground and then they run to go catch that because we only have a main gear and a front gear. We don't have tricycle gear. We don't have any way of preventing the wings from hitting once the plane slows down. So we have to, we're, we're counting on people catching that on time. And uh, for some reason in the middle of our test flights, we got pretty bad at that for a while and then we got better at it later um, with more training. Uh, this is pretty much what it looks like when people fly. I'll show you in a, a couple uh, other perspectives. You can, a, a few other things to notice here is how floppy and wobbly this is and it looks like maybe there's something wrong, but that that's basically from the the pedaling cadence of the pilot, and if you make things any less floppy than this, you're making it too heavy. Let's show one thing to check out if you go, I meant to do a slide of this with the link, but if you go to my YouTube channel, if you just search on Dash Human Powered Airplane on YouTube, um, and my channel, there's a, a link to a uh, playlist, and there's some 3D videos, which are a lot of fun. Um, when you do them on a laptop like this, you basically can pull it around to see the three-dimensional video. On your phone, you can actually turn like this or use a VR headset. So you can see me kind of huffing and puffing in the background. You can see the this guy just let go of the, um, the cable there. And you can also kind of get an idea of what a pilot's eye view is. Now I'm in the air now. I don't know why we lost sound, but for some reason we lost sound. But you can hear when the, the wheel stops. There we go. You could, you could have heard when the wheel stopped uh, being on the ground and when I was flying. You can also tell by looking back at my shadow and seeing that there's light underneath my shadow. Um, I'm going to go switch to just one more perspective here, and then I'll show you the crash video very quickly. Um, this is just a different perspective showing up close so you get a better idea of what it looks like pedaling in the cockpit. You can see he's getting ready. He, now he just let go of the cable. Can't remember which flight this was. I think this is a flight of, I don't know, three or four hundred meters. It's not my longest flight. But you can see everything kind of bounces around there. And we have cameras in a lot of different places recording stuff, which is pretty important for some of the problems we've had. We've been able to, to figure some of those things out. I'll show you the, the crash in just a second. That one. And see if I can find that. Are we doing on time? Just about right. Okay. So, <clears throat> what happened here is he was focusing on staying lined up laterally, and he accidentally put <laughs> he accidentally put a little bit of down elevator. There's another shot we have, but I don't have time to show it. It's actually down the wing where you can see that it, that it basically slight down elevators commanded and it never changes, it never changes back to up because he was concentrating too much on the center line and not on the horizon. Um, but the, a big part of that problem was because the stick we had then just didn't have good stick feel, they're the very weak centering spring. <coughs> so we fixed that with this stick, stick problem that I showed you. And then I don't know why I'm leaving you with two, 
two, two videos of failures here, but the, the, uh, remember we've flown successfully 26 times. Uh, this is what happened when we tried to fly at the end of, uh, we had frost problems on the wing and um, it was heavy and we tried for a long time to dry it off. And also I was heavier and we had a little bit more gear and the wing just never, yeah. So it, it turns out, and you notice right here it's a little bit weird because of the video. Maybe I can see it pause it. It's hard to show. Let me just play it back again. You notice these things sticking out the back here? That was because the flight before was with a 40 meter wing, which is torsionally less stiff. And we had this weird thing where right as I was landing, the wing was started doing this weird torsion. And we're like, whoa, that's not good. Let's go back to the safe wing that we've flown 24 other times. And we'll, we'll put on these sticks so that we can do an angular measurement and stick these um, cameras here so that we can make a very careful angular measurement just to make sure there's no problem with the regular wing that we've been using. But then we did have a problem. And so we're in the middle. It's, it's taken a long time for various reasons, but we're in the middle of analyzing this with software to analyze aero elasticity. Um, and we're getting close to getting the answer. And we're probably going to make some aerodynamic changes to the wing tip to unload the wing a little bit from what it what it was. We might have to do some strengthening in the spar on the center wing section, but I don't think so because we had 26 other successful flights where this wasn't a problem. So I think it has it's some weird interaction with having extra weight on uh, all along the wing with the, the frost, and we'll figure that out and get it fixed. And once we do that, the, the, the previous flight we had uh, the, day, the week before this was the full length of the Moffett runway. We're getting ready to go down to Edwards Air Force Base area and fly much longer flights there because we're basically out of room. And there we'll get a chance to do, we know the wing is very responsive in turning because we've done, you know, S turns on the runway and stuff, but we'll be able to get a chance to do actual, you know, 90 and 180 degree turns and, I don't know, recreate the Kramer course or do circles or triangles and stuff like that. So that's, that's what I have for now. Um, I want to wrap up there so we have a chance for questions. I've got tons of other slides I could show, but. So, we have a mic back here, a yes, couple of mics questions. joined, so. Has anybody ever used a closed wing approach that would add some structural rigidity plus the same amount of lift? So you take that wing length and you tie the tip back into the vertical stabilizer at the top. So you've still got the same length of width, but now you've got a three-dimensional kind of rigid structure. Um, I think I know the kind you're talking about where the, the wing kind of ties into the tail in the back. So I've seen people make drawings of human-powered airplanes doing that, but I don't know if I've ever seen that. But several people, uh, including <coughs> the project that the, the Daedalus guys did before the Monarch speed plane and before Daedalus, was called Chrysalis, and that was a biplane. And so obviously, you know, basically when you build a biplane, you're building a spar that has a uh, spar cap depth of feet instead of inches. And so you can get a lot of strength out of that. But you have to have struts crossing over that add drag. So there's a trade-off there. Also, as you mentioned, you can have, uh, with a biplane, you can have a shorter wingspan for the same equivalent um, induced drag. So there's, there, there's a lot of pot potential advantages to biplanes, and people have done it. I, don't, I haven't seen anybody do what you're, exactly what you're talking about. Next question. Yes. Um, I know you had the issue of transportation brakes in the SPAR. You use the analogy of a pressurized soda can holding it rigid. Yeah. Um, what about pressurizing the spar and eliminating the weight of the biscuits? Yeah, <clears throat> I've gotten that question quite a few times, and I think it's a, it's a viable approach, except I don't know how easy it would be to make sure that you would keep, keep the pressure. Um, but there have been a couple of inflatable um, human-powered airplanes where the entire thing was inflated. It didn't have a carbon fiber spar. There was the Phoenix, the, the reluctant Phoenix, which was a very small delta wing that was too small to really fly very far off the ground. And then there was a huge air, airplane that had over 1,000 square feet um, called the Phoenix. You can look it up by this guy, Fred Toe. Um, and yeah, the idea there was that it was, you know, even the spar was fabric. It was basically, um, uh, you know, pneumatic, whatever you want to like call it. Like a blimp. Um, and, and it's quite interesting. Now the problem that they had, they did fly it a few times, but with that much wing area, 
you can imagine, you know, we have problems in five miles an hour of wind with our, our 35 square meters, which is like, I don't know, I forget what that is in square feet. But anyway, w with that, if you have four times that area, you get blown around by, you know, just the barest puff of wind. So they had real control problems. So they only flew to a few times for very short distances. But yeah, the idea of, of, of getting rid of that little bit of weight by, um, by making something that you can, you can pressurize is a good one. It's just I don't know if you end up adding more weight to, to be able to hold that pressure for, for the flight, flight time. But there's, I mean, if there was a business in this, there's tons of interesting things you could do in building human hardware. It's just, it, you know, it, there's lots of really interesting engineering problems to solve. Uh, no, because I didn't actually try to design that or anything, <laughs> but that's, that's a good question. Uh, that makes me think of another thing that's interesting, though. Um, part of the turning issues and problems that these airplanes have is that um, apparent mass of the weight of the air inside the wing is so large compared to the, the lift and the weight of the plane that that, that makes the turning problem harder. Uh, that's something that people have had to contend with. Yes? Thanks for the talk. Um, in the spirit of simplicity, which is you know one of the objectives of Dash, uh, and specifically uh, transportation of the aircraft, how long does it take to put it together and then take it apart again? <coughs> we've gotten better as we've gone along. Um, I think we've got it down to probably. What do you think, Linda? Forty-five minutes. Uh, to, to, when we have a full crew that's trained up and we've been doing it recently. Maybe takes 45 minutes uh, to put it together, and a little bit less than that to take it apart. It depends, you know. Sometimes when we're out in the field, we have like we had, I kind of skipped over it, but we had problems one time with the front wheel, and we have a bunch of tools out and stuff like that. It takes longer to pack stuff up. But if everything's going well, it's maybe 45 minutes to put it together and half an hour to uh, take it back apart. Uh, I tried the right through the right channels to do Edwards, but they're these days very focused on uh, testing defense stuff there. And uh, the Daedalus guys actually did fly and set some of the cro closed course records and stuff on Rogers Dry Lake, but it doesn't look like that's going to be available to us. If somebody out there uh, from Edwards is watching this video and wants to make that. Uh, be true that we can be down there would be, be great. But um, there are several other dry lakes down in that area that are pretty pretty close by. They're not quite as big as Rogers, but um, they're, they're pretty reasonable. One of the things we want to do now that we've gotten to the point where we're ready to do that is there are some, some records like out and return and triangle uh, speed record or course records that haven't been set for human powered airplanes. So if we just set a modest goal, we'll be able to set some records. But also, the female records are um, relatively achievable. Like I think the, the distance record is about 6.8 kilometers, and the duration is, is like under 30 minutes. And we have some really great female pilots that um, I think are, are going to be able to do that um, with our airplane. And then, you know, the, there's the, the, big, the big, the problem with setting the big one, right? The reason they did it over water is water is, you know, by definition, sea level and relatively flat. You have to get really good weather to do it, and logistically, it's very difficult. Um, you have to have you know, a bunch of boats and rescue divers and all this other stuff. But at least you know you're flying over this flat place. It's really hard to find a, a flat place um, that's 100 plus kilometers long. I've looked at Death Valley. I've looked at Black Rock Desert. Those are about the only two places in the in the Western United States, and as far as I can tell, pretty much in the world that are long enough to do it. Black Rock Desert has um, the problem that it's at 4,000 feet altitude, so aerodynamically it's not as good and the pilot performance is not going to be as good, athletic performance. We'll take one more question and then... Um, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I only showed one picture of, and I didn't show any video Okay, I'll do that. Ground effect is um, uh, if you fly within about 
one or ha one half of a wings span from the ground. On a typical airplane, um, you'll gain some advantage from that. Uh, what it's basically doing is it's blocking those vortices at the tips and, in, and decreasing your induced. It turns out with human powered air, reason when there's any kind of wind at all, it has to do with some sort of micro vortices or something. There's been a lot of uh, suggestions about it, but the Gossamer Albatross people ran into this, the Daedalus people. There is almost an inverse ground effect. It actually, you don't gain anything by being close to the ground. Um, and so that's why I never pay attention in my equations to the, the in ground effect uh, drag. I just pay attention to out of ground effect. And um, when Daedalus flew, they took off from, I think it was a 300 foot cliff. He stayed about 50 feet above the water the entire time. So, and they had about a hundred foot span. So he basically wasn't in ground effect the whole time. But I don't feel that's safe to for land. We're flying over land. And um, so we're limiting ourselves to five meters. I think the highest we've gotten so far is about four meters. We've, we've, we've had some issues with our avionics, but we do have a little radar altimeter thing that's recording it. So sometimes it's recording it. Um, successfully sometimes not but I think the highest we've got is about four and I'm trying to limit it to five over land just because I, I don't want it to get too high so one thing more thing I wanted to mention before I know there's no more questions but um, uh, if you're interested in being on the dash mailing list I left my card here my card was back there um, just contact me I'm gonna I'm gonna make a new announce mailing list where we just make periodic announcements when we're doing testing or whatever and then there's the mailing list that we use for people who actually want to work on the project. This is an all-volunteer project. If anybody's interested in helping out, contact me. We have periodic build sessions. You know, right now it's repairing the plane and getting it ready. We're going to build new things like the mold for the, the nose and stuff like that. So just, just uh, pick up my card and send me an email. Great. So we just want to thank Alec for coming here and explaining his project. Uh, we do have the park forums. Uh, on a regular basis. So please, if you want to join our list, just let me know. We'll be out in the front, Amanda and myself. So thank you very much, Alec. Thank you. We have a reception outside, too. Thank you. And come up here if you want to see any of the stuff. So let's see. This is really easy to stab somebody with, so be careful. But